All right, welcome everyone. Uh, the first thing I wanna do is remind you that your test for chapter six, our second test together on 6.1, 2, 3, and five is available now in my math lab. It is a, a, you know, now live, that is to say, if you're watching this a week later, another story. Um, but you have today and tomorrow, which is November 9th and November 10th, to take that test, you get one attempt. I think it was 14 or 15 questions, somewhere in that ballpark, uh, since some of them are a little longer. You have a review in the homework section. The test is under the quiz and test section. It's immediately under test one. You can't miss it. Remember that you will be submitting your work in Canvas. Uh, if I don't have that link available yet, I cannot remember if I created it. I feel like I created it. I'm fairly confident. I'm almost 99% confident that I've created it at this point. But if I hadn't, I'll make sure it's up today. And remember, you're supposed to submit that within 15 minutes of completing the test. So when you finish, first thing you need to do is start taking pictures and upload them to the internet. Uh, and then you can email me and say, hey, Mr. Beckner, check out question 12, check out question nine. I've got good work. I think I deserve some partial credit. You can say more than that um, if you would like. But, and then I can hopefully get you some partial credit, assuming that you deserve it, because I am all about that, as long as it's deserved, not just, hey, I... The answer was five and I wrote 5.2. If you have no work, then you know, we'll say, well, how did you get 5.2? Still get no credit. All right, so remember, no exceptions to those due dates unless you have some kind of note, doctor's note, court note, something like that, uh, official documentation. <clears throat> remember that you are allowed to use the formula sheet that I provided, I know that's in Canvas. And you know what, I'll even pull it up. And that gives me an opportunity to see that I have the link provided. I do, submit test to work. Please don't submit to where it says final exam. I can't actually, why does this program make me a liar so many times? <laughs> Last week, I cannot tell you how many times I tried to hide that and the button would not work. <laughs> That's hilarious. I love technology. All right, so you should only see these. Don't submit to test one, submit it to test two. Uh, and then the, here's your formula sheet, which should be as I described, you would get. I am not giving you the formula sheets for the sums and differences of cosines and sines. I'm giving you the formulas for tangent, but not the plus or minuses. I'm not giving you the double angle for sine, but I am giving you all of the cosines and the tangent. I'm giving you all of the half angles. Please note that the variable references on this are slightly different than before. Uh, before it was a theta here and a theta over two. Don't let that confuse you. It's the concept and the formula itself that is supposed to be the main idea, not just the fact that this says x over 2 and this is x. It's the same as if this was theta over 2 and this was theta, or if this was 2 theta and that was theta. The variable itself doesn't matter. It's the application of it. Okay, so let's pick up where we left off in 7.1, the law of signs. So as a reminder about that formula, we've done several problems and not even close to being done yet. Here's our law of sines, just the length of a side over the sine of its angle opposite of that side is equal to any of the other uh, pairs of length of sides to sines of the angles opposite of them, whether you're using the Greeks <clears throat> letter, the Greek letters or the just capitalized letters, and we've done both to make sure that we're used to them. We've talked about how you have some simple cases, like if you have two angles given to you, you know there will be one triangle and only one triangle, and you know you can start it off very easily by finding the third angle by just doing 180 minus the other two. Several examples, several examples. Then we got to what we call the ambiguous case, where you are given two sides and an angle instead, and it happens to be that the angle you're given is not between those two sides, and that's important. That is very important because if the angle is between the two sides, then you would do the law of cosines, which would be in the next section. So you could have this angle or you could have this angle, but you can't have the one between those two sides, the one that connects the sides. So this angle right here would be the only option that you couldn't use for this. <clears throat> and we talked about how given these parameters, it's actually possible that somebody just gives you some numbers and the triangle doesn't even exist. It's possible that someone gives you a triangle and there is just the one scenario, but it's also possible that just the heavens and stars align perfectly 
that you could swing that length of A in or out <clears throat> and make either a smaller or larger triangle. And there can be two scenarios. Now we haven't seen that case happen yet, hint, wink, nudge, but we have seen the one triangle and no triangle case. How do we determine whether there's two triangles? Well, once you have your second angle, so they give you one, you find the second, that'll be the first thing you do. You take the supplement of it because it turns out that if there is a second triangle, the supplement of the first version is the second version. And I kind of rationalized it to y'all a little bit. And then we said, okay, if this angle, in addition to the original angle provided, if those are small enough to form a triangle, in other words, if they're less than 180 degrees, then that means the second triangle does in fact exist. So you complete your first triangle, then you use that supplemented angle <clears throat> to complete the second triangle. We said there's no triangle if your calculator spits out an error in the process, essentially. Um, but it's nice to understand the rationalization of it. And we said that the rationalization of it is when you go to take an inverse sine, you end up taking an inverse sine of something larger than one or smaller than negative one. Generally larger than one since we're dealing from zero to 180 degrees and signs are all positive from 0 to 180. So if this number inside, if you just calculated this number, whoa, that's really weird if you try and use the drawing tablet with paper on it. <laughs> if this number was bigger than 1, which turned out to be 1.5, then it can't happen because it's undefined. And that's what happened for case B. <clears throat> so a reminder for problem A, which I should have said problem B just a second ago. When we found our second angle, we did it supplement, and it turned out that that angle along with the given angle was too big to form another triangle, which is why there was only one triangle. This one, again, the inverse sign didn't exist because the inside value was bigger than one. And I think you know where we're going with C. Is this going to be enough space? I think it'll be enough space. Whoa, that was weird. Uh, da, 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 da. <clears throat> Why did it take me all the way back there? C. Where is my problem? <clears throat> Angle capital B equals five degrees. Wait, no, that's the wrong problem. The uh, I'm on the wrong page. <clears throat> Side A is thirty. Side B is 40, then angle A or alpha is 20 degrees. <clears throat> now remember, if we're talking applications, I'd have to be giving units of these 30 inches, 30 miles, 30 kilometers, 30 something, but that's not the case here, obviously. <clears throat> All right, and if you wanted to try and draw up a triangle, you can, but like I said, this is the ambiguous case because we only have one angle and it's not the angle between them. If this was the angle between them, if these legs are A and B, then this would be angle C. So we have to use the law of sines <coughs> to start the cell. We have the A's completed. So that has to be one of the sides of our equation. So we'll go for law of sines. 30 over the sine of 20 degrees. And I did mention that you can flip these upside down as long as they're all flipped upside down. We have the value of B, so let's go after angle B. We're gonna cross multiply, and that'll give us 30 sine of B or beta equals 40 sine of 20 degrees. We're then going to divide by the 30 to start the isolating of the sine of beta. <coughs> So we get the sine of B or beta equals 40 sine of 20 degrees over 30. Once again, yes, the 40 and the 30 do reduce. However, <clears throat> because we're going to be putting this in a calculator, you don't have to if you don't want to. So you could make this 4 sine of 20 degrees over 3 or leave it alone. And then because this says sine of B equals, we take the inverse sine of both sides. So 
So we go, oops, wrong color, inverse sine, oops, switch back the color. Side. Sorry, I got distracted. My trash truck was coming by. <laughs> Now with all that information on the right, you definitely want to put that in parentheses. <clears throat> now the reason we do this is because as long as we are in the appropriate quadrants, the inverse sine and sine cancel. So that will tell us that B, angle B or beta is equal to inverse sine of that 40 sine of 20 degrees over 30 or four over three if you reduced it. And we said, well, we really do wanna have an approximation for this. So we're gonna round this to the nearest 10th. That's pretty common. Pay attention to the my math of instructions. They might tell you to round it a whole or 20th. Why did I say 20th? 100th. <laughs> wow, that was bad. <clears throat> All right, check your mode. I'm in degrees still. <clears throat> Inverse sine, 40 sine of 20 degrees. Close that parentheses, divide by 30. Close the inverse sine's parentheses. And if you don't trust that this is the same answer with 4 thirds, I'm just going to delete the zeros for the 40 and the 30. Same answer. So that's about 27.1 degrees. Now notice I keep saying as long as the angle is in the appropriate quadrant, as long as it's in quadrant one or four, which four would be impossible, which means this angle has to be between zero and 90. That is an issue that might come up later. Just as a fair warning, that issue might come up later. All right, so if there is a second triangle, so we go is there a, second triangle. Well, if there is, we say that B2 would be 180 degrees minus the 27.1 degrees. This is the supplement of it, which will be, what's that, 50, 52.9? 152.9, that is. So that would be the second angle if it fits. How do we know if it fits if this angle plus the given angle, if they're still less than 180 degrees? So we take angle A plus B2, which is 20 plus 152.9, which is pretty close, but it's 172.9 degrees, which is less than 180 degrees. So yes, it does fit. So B, we need to instead call B1 so that we can tell it's dealing with the first version of it. And B2 obviously is B2. <clears throat> so there are two triangles finally. Now remember, there will not be second versions of anything that was given to you. There is no little a2, there is no big a2, there is no little b2, b2. But the other three things, which would be uh, angle B, angle C, and side C, those will all have two versions. Now we already have some of those answers. So angle C, angle B, and side C. That's six different answers that we'll need where we already have, where is it? <laughs> two of them. All right, so let's keep going on. Let's, for now, Let's ignore all this B2 stuff. I'm not gonna scratch it out permanently. I'm just saying, ignore it. Let's just focus on one triangle at a time because you will get something messed up if you're trying to, to crisscross your triangles. So I'm gonna ignore that for now. I'm pretending it's not there. Of course, I'm not actually going to erase it. I'm just ignoring it. We're only dealing with triangle one. So for triangle one, we have B1. So B1 is equal to the 27.1 degrees. That is our first of the three answers for triangle one. <clears throat> now we need angle C1 and side C1. Well, C1, angle C1, that should be a capital C, it looks too lowercase, doesn't it? C1 is 180 degrees minus the other two angles we have, A and B1. 
So 20 degrees and 27.1 degrees. 160, 140, 130, 2.9. So that's our C1. That's the first version of angle C. <clears throat> Now that we know angle C, we can find side C by doing the law of sine. So we do law of sines. Now we have <clears throat> the A's were completed given to us. These were given to us and they're completed so we can law of sines that with, with that still. We do have the B's completed now, but we rounded to get that B1. So it's not my favorite thing in the world to find C1, side C1 based on a rounded number because that could be rounded even further. An error propagation happens. So I'm gonna use the A's again. So I'm gonna go 30 over sine of 20 degrees. That was little a over sine of angle A equals. And then little C1 over the sine of angle C1, which is the 132 nine degrees. You could cross multiply but then you'll have an extra step so I'm just going to take that single step and again you choose the amount of algebra you do and multiply both sides by sine of 132.9 degrees. So that little c1 is equal to 30 sine of 132.9 degrees. It's an ugly decimal. <laughs> Let me make that a little better over the sine of 20 degrees, which when we round to the nearest tenth, so we're approximating, so we squiggle equals. We go 30 times the sine of 132.9, close it, divided by the sine of 20, close it. Now I technically don't have to close that, that last one but it's just a good idea. 64.25, that's gonna to round to 64.3. So this is kind of what, this is kind of at that breaking point. That's really close to being rounded down to 64.2 if it had been 0.24, say. Then we would have rounded down to 64.2. Now, if we had used angle B1, which was rounded to get side C1, there would have been that error propagation. And if it went down, maybe this would get us 64.2 for one blah, 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 blah. And then we'd say the answer is 64.2 instead of 64.3, and my math lab will probably mark it wrong. Sometimes they have error ratios built into. Sometimes they don't. Um, I, give me 30 seconds. Not even 30 seconds. All right, so that's about 64.3, and that's, an, that's a side link, so not degree, 64.3. So that's our C1, our little C1. This is why I prefer the Greek letters, because capital C and lowercase c look so much like each other. So we got angle C1. In fact, I'm going to try and just make that a little smaller looking. A to C. There we go. That's better. So B1, C1, C1. We have the three pieces of our completed triangle. And if you prefer to have that all just boxed up together, you can. So you could say at this point, B1 equals 27.1 degrees. Angle C1 is 132.9 degrees. And then little C1 is 64.3 meters, feet, whatever. So there's triangle one along with these three sides and angles to complete it. Now we got to move on to triangle two. Now in triangle two, none of this matters. Anything that came from triangle one with the exception of what was assigned doesn't matter. So we're not going to use any of that. We are only using this stuff. We already actually found B2, in fact, because finding B2 is part of the process to tell if it even exists. So we have B2 here. So that's done. So for triangle two, we know B2 from before was 152.9. So that's one of them. 
So we've got that along with these three things. We have the A's completed. We have the B's completed. So all we need are the C's. We have two angles to set so find angle C2, just do 180 minus the others. So angle C2 would be the 180 degrees minus the others. So the A is still 20. Remember, no second versions of prescribed values. And then minus B2, which is the 152.9 degrees. That's 160, it's gonna be 7.1 degrees, a really small angle. That's our C2, angle C2. That puts us almost done. To find side C2, we just law of sines it. So we go to the A's, which is 30 over sine of 20 degrees, equals the C's, which will be little c2 over the sine of angle c2, which is the 7.1 degrees. You can cross multiply, and then you'll end up having to divide by sine of 20 degrees. That's two steps. <clears throat> or you can take the one-step method, <clears throat> where we multiply both sides. Uh, it's going to get really loud. Hold on, you're, you're gonna have to wait two minutes. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry about that. Um, if I haven't said before, I've got a construction project going on my house and the trash truck was picking all this stuff and it was very loud dumping it. So I was just gonna be distracted anyways. All right, back to where we were. So we said one step, multiply both sides by the denominator of your variable, which is the sine of 7.1 degrees. Okay, so we get that Side C2, that's a little c, little c, equals 30 sine of 7.1 degrees over the sine of 20 degrees. And then we're going to round to the nearest tenth per usual. We're almost done with this problem. 30 sine 7.1, close it, divided by sine of 20 degrees, close it. You can check your mode again if you have to. Check it as many times as you feel the need. And we get 10 point, when we round in there is 10th, eight. Now again, because that's a four, if we had used borrowed information, maybe that error propagates up and it becomes 0.85, then we round that to a nine, and now we get the whole thing wrong in my math lab, or at least not the whole thing, just that one, because it will be separate answers. And then you're like, oh man, why did I get it wrong? The answer is 10.8 and I wrote 10.9. That's why we try not to use rounded values in, formulas and equations and processes down the line if we don't have to. We can't always prevent that in math, but when we can, we do. All right, that was about 10.8. So that was our C2, little c2. Let me make that a little more little looking. There we go. So we have all of those boxes individually. If you prefer to put them all together, that tells us angle B2 was 152.9 degrees. Angle C2 was the 7.1 degrees, and then side C2 was the 10.8 meters, feet, whatever. Now this is important. A lot of people will say, well, since the Bs were supplements of each other, shouldn't the Cs be? Nope. These do not add to 180 degrees. It works for the Bs because of geometry, but not the Cs. I am absolutely 100% confident that I will give you one of these on test three. You will get a problem with two triangles. So 
So you need to understand how to tell if there's two. First, you need to understand which case makes it possible to have a second triangle, which is when you're only given one angle and it's not the one between them. Then you have to know how to establish the second triangle even exists. Then you have to make sure you're keeping all of the first triangle information and all of the second triangle information separated to their own kind of piles. Now, do you have to find all of triangle one and then all of triangle two? No, you absolutely do not. But trust me, it is a better way to keep your information organized. Some people will go, all right, well, here's angle C1. Now let me find angle C2. All right, here's side C1. Now let me find side C2. Sure, you can, but I do, I do personally believe that people that do it that way tend to make more mistakes uh, if even just in labeling things. <clears throat> All right, now I know that problem was much more challenging than the others that we've done in this chapter for very obvious reasons. So I will make sure we do a second one. Spoilers for D. So little a equals seven, little b equals 28. And I don't have to give you a and b, I can give you b and c or a and c, it doesn't matter. And then we'll go with angle, and I'm gonna go back to Greek alpha equals 12 degrees, or capital A if you prefer, but again, in my math lab or future classes, you could see it either way. When you get on a calculus, it's pretty rare that people use capital letters instead of the Greek letters. And if you go past calculus, you end up learning the whole Greek alphabet, and there's some really wacky looking letters in the Greek alphabet. Like one of them just literally looks like a squiggle, but we're not using that one. All right, so what case are we in? Well, we only have one angle, so we're not under the easiest case. If this angle was between these two sides, we would be under a case I haven't even taught you how to figure out yet, so hopefully that's not it. Well, that would be angle C or gamma if it was the one between these two. If I gave you legs A and C, angle B would be between the two. If I gave you sides B and C, angle A would be between the two. So this is the ambiguous case, which means it's possible it's one triangle. It's possible there are no triangles. It's possible there are two triangles. Don't worry, three, four, five triangles, not possible, never possible. So this is the ambiguous case, and I've already basically told you what this one's going to be, <laughs> but let's establish it. All right, so I can't just go and find another angle really quickly uh, by doing 180 minus two others, because I only have one of them. So I'm gonna have to do law of signs. And there's only one possible law of signs to do currently. It's taking the completed A's, the seven over the sine, how much, before I, before I progress, I need to do this. Come on, go down. There we go, perfect. Just give me some more space so I don't screw things up. All right, so doing the law of sines, we do A over sine A, so seven over sine of 12 degrees, equals the B over the B, sine B, so 28 over sine of, not B as I'm using Greek, sine of beta. Cross multiply, and you'll get seven sine of beta equals 28 sine of 12 degrees. Degrees is a little low, isn't it? Then you're going to divide both sides by the seven so that you can get rid of that and isolate the sine term. So what we get here is wrong color, sine of beta equals 28 sine of 12 degrees over seven. Again, yes, they can reduce. I'm doing that intentionally and you don't have to reduce. And then you take the inverse sign of both sides. So we go inverse sign of the left, inverse sign of the right, sine of beta, and then 28 sine 12 degrees over seven. Now again, we're kind of making a big assumption here 
that the angle is going to actually be between zero and 90. But it's usually okay. It stops being okay in the next section, but we'll have a way to get around that in the next section. For now, we don't have a way around it. So the inverse sine and the sine cancel. So what we end up getting is that angle beta is 28. I'm sorry, I forgot my inverse sine. Definitely don't want to forget that. Inverse sine of 28 sine of 12 degrees all over seven. And again, that could just be four times sine of 12 degrees. We'll round that to the nearest 10th. Let me do this. Just so I can still see the calculator on the screen. That's been a little annoying. Inverse sine, 28 sine, 12 degrees, close it. Divided by seven, close it. And we get 56. 0.26 blah 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 rounded to the nearest tenth is 56.3 but is there a triangle two question mark is this a b1 or is it just b or beta excuse me is this beta one or is it just beta if there is a second triangle if there is a second triangle then the supplement of this would be the second version of the angle so b2 beta two, beta two, if it exists, would be 180 degrees minus 56.3 degrees. So that's 23.7, 123.7? Yeah, I had to check myself for a second. So again, that's if it exists. But does it fit? Does it fit? So this is where we take the angle they gave us, add this new second version, and if that value is small enough, if it's less than 180, then we know we're good. So we take alpha plus beta two, and that would be 12 degrees plus 123.7 degrees, which would be 135.7 degrees, right? And 135.7 degrees is less than 180. So yes, there is a second triangle. So now we call angle B beta one, angle beta beta one, which is 56.3 degrees. And then beta two, would be the 123.7. Now again, anything prescribed does not have a second value. There is no little a2, there is no alpha2, there is no little b2. We can only have second versions of things not given to us. These are fixed because we were told they are what they are. So for triangle one, well, first of all, we already know, and I'm writing it for a third time, the first beta, beta one, is the 56.3 degrees. We got that pretty quickly. So we have A's completed, we have the B's completed, now we need to attack the C's. Well, the angle is the easiest to attack, not C2, gamma two. I just said C, so it threw me off. Gamma two, which is capital C two, that's 180 degrees minus alpha, which is 12, minus B1, which is the 56.3. See, I'm ignoring the B2 for a while. I'm pretending this doesn't exist until we get to triangle two. But I don't actually want to erase it. So that's 170, 168. <clears throat> uh, and that'd be 0.7, 111.7 degrees. That's our gamma 2 or capital C2, whatever you prefer. So we got our B1, beta 1. We got our capital C2 or gamma 2. Now all we need is that third side, which is little c2. We'll have to do law of sines for that. So we'll use the completed A's again. That's the nice thing. When you keep doing these over and over and over, you end up referring back to that same half of an equation. Seven, over the sine of 12 degrees, 
equals. <clears throat> now we're approaching, we're trying to attack the C's. So little c2 over the sine of its angle. Why did I write one? Why am I writing twos? Race, gamma, gamma, probably because I had just said b2 up there. That's my bad. Gamma one, we're talking about triangle one, gamma one, gamma one, gamma one, 117, 111.17. 111.7 degrees, good lord. One plus one is 17, I'm joking. You could cross multiply and then divide by the sine of 12 degrees, or if you wanna get this in one step, multiply both sides by sine of 111.7 degrees. Which would tell us that little c one, is equal to seven times the sine of 111.7 degrees over the sine of 12 degrees. Rounding to the nearest tenth, seven sine 111.7 divided by sine of 12. And we get 31.2 blah, 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 so 31.3. And that's a length, so no degrees, 31.3. So that is what we're gonna call little c1. One, two, three, boom, triangle one is done. Everything is labeled correctly now. I, I fixed my twos. Again, I apologize for that. Make sure that if you do any little mistakes like that, that you're able to catch them. That's what I, that's what a good, I don't wanna say mathematician, just a well-numerate stu student or person does is they can catch errors on the fly. They're always checking themselves. They're always looking back at things and, and making sure everything fits and makes sense. All right, now we're up to triangle two. So remember, we're still using everything given. We still have these three values. They haven't changed. But angle beta two, side C2, and angle gamma two all need to be found. Well, actually we already found one of them. We already found beta two because a second triangle existing all hinges on beta two being small enough, finding beta two and it being small enough. So borrowed information, because we already found it, beta two was the 123.7 degrees. Box it up, ship it out which makes gamma two, <laughs> 180 minus the original alpha, which stayed the same of 12 degrees, minus this new beta of 123.7 degrees. And what do we get for that? What do we get for that? Is it 23.5? Wait, why did I say 23.5? Because I was looking at that, that's wrong. Uh, da, 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 168. 44.3, 44.3 degrees. So that's our gamma two. We got beta two, we got gamma two. Now all we need is little c2, which we do law of sines to find. Seven over sine of 12 degrees equals c2 over the sine of gamma two, 44.3 degrees. Cross multiply and then divide by sine of 12 or just multiply both sides by the sine 44.3 degrees so that we get little c2 is equal to seven sine 44.3 degrees all over the sine of 12 degrees. Remember if you're doing this right you'll notice a lot of similarities in structure. Look at c1 versus c2. <clears throat> the only thing that's changed is the sine and the top. So we approximate this to the nearest tenth, seven sine 44.3, close it, divided by sine 12. And closing those parentheses is critical. I think I did something wrong. I did a, I had a sign up there instead of seven. Seven sine 44.3. See, I got an answer that just didn't make sense. I looked at my calculator and I saw I made a typo. Seven sine of 44.3, Close divided by sine of 12, close, boom, 
23.5 makes much more sense. And you'll notice I said that number earlier. It's because I was looking at my notes and I was like, wait a minute. That doesn't add correctly. But then I realized, obviously, I wasn't looking at the correct number, was I? All right, 23.5. So when I did it in my head, I had 44.3. Saw the 23.5 and went, uh. And they went, nope, that's because that was C2. That's our C2. Boom, boom, boom. Three answers for a triangle means it's done. You want to put it all together, beta 2, 123.7 degrees. And I have a degree symbol here, which is not right. For C2, that was a length, not a degree. <clears throat> Gamma 2, 44.3 degrees. Little C2, 23.5. not degrees. Which I never actually put all that information together for the first triangle. So for triangle one, if you wanted to write it all together, B1, 56.3 degrees, gamma one, 111.7 degrees, little c1, 31.3, not degrees, not degrees. There we are. When you pull back, you can see a pretty dink, decently lengthy problem. It's a lot to keep track of. But we weren't doing any new math here. Literally nothing we did in this process was new. We're just putting a whole bunch of different processes together. These are very easy problems to just go and say, oh, it's only one triangle. If I don't see a student try to find a second triangle, in the past I have gone back and awarded zero credit for a problem if I felt it necessary, if they didn't even try. I'm not saying that's what I'll always do, but if I go back and look at your work, I see, oh, here's their two triangle problem, and they, they got half of the answers right because they got the first triangle, but they didn't even try a second triangle. While my math lab may give you 50% of the points of that problem, I may go back and say, well, honestly, you only deserve 25% because you didn't understand the bigger picture of things. So I do reserve that right, as I've pointed out before. Do I always execute that right? It depends. On a more traditional test, I actually make these problems worth more points and, I'm, and I don't even tell which students or which problem it is. I'll say, okay, if a problem has two triangles, it's worth nine points instead of just six. <clears throat> but that's an if. I don't tell you, oh, question seven has two triangles, question three has two triangles. No, it's just, if there is one, it's gonna be worth nine instead of six or five or whatever points. But I'm not giving a traditional test, not as traditional at least, so I'm just trying to run things a little differently because of that. So please, in your notes, make sure you're trying to see if there's a second triangle, but only try on problems where it's relevant, where it's this ambiguous case. If you try and make a second triangle out of a problem that gave you two angles, I can go back and take off points for misunderstanding information there. Again, I don't usually try and just hunt down points to take away from you, but I definitely have that right reserved. All right. <clears throat> So that's all the problems I'm gonna do for this topic, but we do have one more type of problem to do in here. And I'm not exactly sure why this problem in this is in this section. I mean, I, I do know why, but I think it would make more sense to put it in the next section for reasons I'll explain. But the only reason it is in this section is because it has a sine instead of a cosine in the formula. All right, so let's pull back in. Make sure we got space. Oh, I do have plenty of space. The area, R, area of an oblique triangle. So remember, oblique means not necessarily a right angle in there somewhere. You better know the area of a traditional triangle. So the area of a right triangle, first of all, so this is different.
it's one half the base times the height. Where if you draw it from this perspective, this would be your base and this would be your height. Why is it one half base times height? Because if you drew this, that, that doesn't look like an H, does it? I can do better than that. H. Because if you drew this triangle on top of itself, if you flip it across the hypotenuse, this would also be H, this would also be B. Now you have a square of width B and, and length H, or height H, however you want to call it. And that area is base times height, B times H. But there's two of those triangles, so you just half it because you really only had one to begin with. That's the entire reasoning behind the formula of a right triangle being one half times base times height. Well, now we're talking about a triangle that is no longer right, it's oblique. So your triangle might look more something like this maybe. And we could show, and it's not very difficult to show, that if this is your height, you can project another triangle there by doing some very simple trigonometry. And, and that height right there, well, if you call this h, and then you call this your angle uh, theta, well, the sine of theta would be h over this value. And then you can just solve for h and say that h is that value times the sine of theta. And that's all the formula really gets. It's just one of these two things. I, I, I didn't draw, I didn't mean to draw it there. You can, but it's actually better to do it here so that it's consistent. Let me draw the height there. This is just an arbitrary further distance out. So that h, if this is your theta, we would say the sine of theta is equal to h over Let me just call this distance C. So C, if you solve for it, it would be just be sine of theta over, I'm sorry, it would be H over sine of theta. And then you can just plug in that into this and what you end up getting instead is, A equals one half B times C times the sine of angle A. But that's only one possible reference out of all of those. It could also be one half A times C times the sine of angle B. Or it could be one half A times B times the sine of angle C. So you've got three versions of the area formula just based on which two legs and which angle you have. Now, this is not the case that we were just talking about with the ambiguous case. This is the angle between these two given lengths. So what we're saying is if we have a triangle drawn up like this, if this is leg A and B, then this is angle A. Or if you have your triangle drawn up like this, if we have A and C, then this is angle B. Or if we have a triangle drawn up like this, we got C and B, and then this would be angle A. I'm not, these two cases are swapped, but that's all right. See, this picture actually goes with this case, this picture actually goes with this case. I'm just showing all three of them, not necessarily paired up evenly. So this is how we can find an area of an oblique triangle, but the things you have to be given are very specific. You must be given what I call a corner of information. I call it a corner of information because it goes leg, angle, leg. That's a corner, or this is a corner, or this is a corner. So a corner of information means more specifically, you have two sides and the angle between them. I will be using that phrase in the next section 
quite liberally. And this, again, is not the case of anything having to do with law of sines. This formula, in my opinion, should not be in the law of sines section. But I think the reason a lot of trig textbooks put it in the law of sines section is because the formula has sine in it. Okay, I get that. But in the next section, when we learn about the law of cosines, this, these three cases are what we're going to be dealing with. So I just feel like personally, it would have made more sense to throw this formula in the law of cosine section, even though it has the word sine in it. Oh no. But again, it's the same scenario. This fits more of a law of cosine scenario better than a law of sine scenario. It's not a very tough formula to memorize. You might say, well, it's three of them. So yes, it is, Mr. Beckner. You know what I'm going to tell you. This is one thing to memorize, and you just have three variations of it. The, it's a one half because formula of area of a triangle is one half base times height. This is basically your base, and this is basically your height, just depending on how you orient the triangle. So it's two legs and then the different angle with a sign. Two legs and then a different angle with a sign. Two legs and then the different angle and a sign. That is an easy formula to remember. It's one formula in my opinion, not three. I will never put that on a formula sheet for you. I will be honest, it is not something we're going to use over and over and over and over and over. It is something we'll see in this section. Maybe one more problem somewhere down the line, but that's pretty much it. I'm not saying it's not useful, it is extremely useful. It's just for our course, we can't really extend the concept much past that, so it's kind of a dead end for us. But again, it does have lots and lots and lots and lots of applications. Maybe you're gonna go build a triangular garden and you wanna know how much soil you need to build or you need for the build. Uh, and you know the lengths of fence, the A and the B here, and then you can just get a protractor and measure angle A, and then boom, you can calculate the area. I know a lot of people don't build triangular gardens, but I do know at least one person in my life that has, and I taught them how to find its area. And they went, holy cow, math is good. <laughs> or something like that. I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing because it was years ago. All right, example, what do we have to three? Find the area. Okay, I'll actually draw a triangle for the first time in a while for a problem. If it looks like a right triangle, don't assume. This will be a seven. This will be an eight, and this angle right here will be 73 degrees. See, not a right triangle. <clears throat> now, I don't care whether you call the 7A or B or C. I don't care whether you call the 8 an A, B, or C. What I care about is that you understand you have a corner of information, <clears throat> which means you can use the formula. So the area is 1 half the product of the legs, 7 times 8, times the sine of the angle between them. That's it. There's no crazy algebra. There's no second triangle. None of that goofy stuff. And then guess what? You just put in a calculator and round however they tell you to round. Which, me classically, I like one decimal. So one half times seven times eight. And yes, I could have done 0.5 times the sine of 73 degrees. And we get 26.77 blah, 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 blah. So that's 26.8. So that's our area. I did not give any units, so this is unitless. If I had said this was seven inches and eight inches, this area would not be 26.8 inches. It would be inches squared. Don't forget that. Handwritten test, I would definitely dock someone for that. You have got to understand units in here. How area, volumes, how their units are squared or cubed. That's it, that's the whole problem. B, I'm going to go back to giving you the information just straight up. A equals 40 meters. Little c equals 121 meters. And let's go angle beta. Let's go back to the Greek. And that's 11 degrees. This angle is not the angle opposite of A or C. So this is a corner of information. I could draw it up and make it look exactly like the last one if I really wanted to. It wouldn't look too much to scale if I'm calling this 11 degrees. So maybe you just want to make it a little tighter like this. That almost looks right, but it's not. But I never asked you to draw it, so you don't have to. Corner of information, formula. Doesn't matter if this is A and C or 
A and B or B and C as long as this is not one of those angles opposites. So it's one half the product of the legs times the sine of 11 degrees. One divided by two times 40, which is 20 times 121 times the sine of 11. Drum roll, we get 461.757, represent. <laughs> Sorry, I'm silly. 461.8 rounded to the nearest tenth. 461.8. And if a student boxed this up and shifted out on a handwritten test, that's wrong. I'd give them tons of partial credit, but it's wrong. Now, oh, I forgot my units. That's right. Well, those are meters, so this is meters. Well, nope, that student would not get any more partial credit. As we're talking an area, that's meters squared. And the reason is because this was 40 meters times 121 meters. If you actually wrote your units, if you did proper dimensional analysis, meters times meters is meters squared. So that's our area. This angle right here makes a major difference on the area. What if that angle had been much, much larger? Let's say it was 100 degrees instead. So let me just pull up that problem again. And let me just make the sine of the angle, instead of 11 degrees, I'm going to make it 100 degrees. So now, now instead of our triangle looking something like this, with a really tight 11 degrees, and again, this is not right, now it's a much wider triangle. Uh, that's 100 degrees, which makes that the ending point. Maybe that'll cause the area to be larger, smaller. Let's see. Because a lot of people th might think that angle doesn't really make much of a difference. But look at that. That is about five times the area, just from going from a really narrow angle in that corner to a really wide angle in that corner. Narrow angles tend to make narrow triangles narrow, less area. area. Once again, I feel this would have been more appropriate in the next section because this is the scenario of information we're going to be given when we use the law of cosines. Law of sines, we wouldn't necessarily have this 8, we might have this might be the 8 instead, and then that angle is not between them. This would be the angle between them. So this would be a situation where we can find <clears throat> all of the different sides, angles, maybe a second triangle, but with just these three numbers, I can't find the area. I would need to find this angle or this side. Now, I certainly can do that in the processes we've just done. I could certainly complete this triangle, then use any of the three corners of information, because you would have all three, and find the area. And all three of those areas would match 100%. Yeah. Yeah. 12 minutes, 13 minutes. Well, that's an awkward spot to end in. Wait, no, I have one more example. Uh, ooh, this one was from an old edition. <laughs> I forgot that. Well, let me see if it's the same problem. I can probably find it if not, because usually they just reorder the numbers. Sweet, it's the same one. All right. Oh, I got to pull up the textbook, though. I don't want to have to type all that out. What's going to be quicker? You know what? It will probably be quicker to type it. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. So our example for just FYI is text example, not example, homework. Problem number 51. Yes. So if you want the reference, if you got your textbook next to you, you can do that. And I'm going to type this quick. The Leaning Tower of Pisa. Please excuse me not capitalizing things. In Italy, leans at an angle about 84.7 degrees. Figure shows that 171 feet, I'll get the typo fixed later, from base of the tower, the angle of elevation up is 50 degrees. Find the distance nearest tenth. 
three foot from the base top of the tower. I don't have to give you an image for this, but it will. <clears throat> the information is all there. But the image that they're describing is we have our leaning tower of Pisa. So yeah, it kind of looks like a cylinder vertically. Uh, let's have the tower be in red. But it's slanted a little. And I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit here. <laughs> but here's your tower. Then what we're doing is we're making a triangle out of this. So from the top to its base, this angle right here is 84.7 degrees. Then they say the angle of elevation to the top is 50 from a distance 171 out. So something like this. So we are 171 feet. That's from here to here. That's just the width of that triangle I just drew from base to some point of observation. And someone observes that that right there is 50 degrees. So it's very well measured that this angle of elevation for the Leaning Tower piece is about 84.7 degrees. And someone could just walk out 171 feet. They can measure it exactly. Then they can get a protractor, a laser device, or something like that and measure 50 degrees to the top. Now, the question we have is, find the distance to the nearest tenth of a foot from the base to the top. In other words, we're trying to find what was supposed to be the height of the tower. So I'm going to put this in little parentheses. It's not an actual height, because heights are always supposed to be just straight up vertical. But when the tower was designed, it was supposed to be the height. We're f trying to find how tall the structure was. If you weighed it on its back, side, whatever, from end to end, bottom to top. Now you might say, well, how can we do this? You gave me two angles and a side. Well, actually, that's pretty easy, right? The two angle and a side case is going back to the beginning. So this is the AAS case, or ASA case, uh, AAS in particular. Two angles and a side. So the easiest thing to do is find the third angle. So what angle is this? I don't know. Let me call it angle C. So angle C, capital C, would be 180 degrees minus the other two angles. So 50 degrees minus the 84.7 degrees. So that's 130, uh, maybe 50, 45.3. Yes, 45.3. So that's that angle at the top. Did I actually need to do that? Yes, actually I did. Maybe, maybe not. Hmm, I don't know. I did it anyways, but in fact, I didn't actually need to. Maybe, maybe not. I'm sorry, I'm messing with y'all. All right, so we know all three of the angles and we have this side completed. Now we're trying to find the distance here, this height. So we need a completed pair of information. Well, in fact, we did actually need it. The completed pair of information is the C's. So that's going to be the first side of our law of signs. So law of signs states we're going to go little c over sine of angle c, so 171 over sine of 45.3 degrees. And that should be equal to. Now, do I need this distance if I call this a b? Do we actually need it? Well, nowhere up here did they say we needed it. So while I can certainly find it, and I could use this angle and this B to find it, I don't have to, so I'm not going to. All we need to find is H. Well, here's the angle opposite of that, so that should be what's on the other side. So we'll go H over, and I could have labeled that with any other letter I like, the sine of 50 degrees. All right, well, to solve for the H, you can just simply multiply both sides by the sine of 50 degrees. You can cross multiply and double step it if you like. Nobody's gonna care which method you take as long as you got a method that works. And that's gonna tell us that 
the height of the tower of Pisa, again, not the actual height, just the height of the building itself if it hadn't been tilted, will be 171 times the sine of 50 degrees over the sine 45.3 degrees, which they told, told us to round in the year's 10th, no surprise. 171, sine of 50, close it, divided by sine of 45.3, close it. And we get 184 point, when we round to the nearest tenth, three, 184.3, 184.3. This was measured in feet. So there we go. The Leaning Tower of Pisa was supposed to stand 184.3 feet tall. Here's a fun problem to try out. And this is not, I'm not gonna do it, but you could ask, how tall is it actually? So here's your triangle with your H, and you know that distance. Well, what you do is you make this the actual H. You end up making a right triangle. You've got this angle still, it's 84.7 degrees. You know this is 184.3. So you can use the hypotenuse. We can just ignore all of this. So we can go H, 184.3, and the angle of 84. 7 degrees, and we could use sine. We could say the sine of 84.7 degrees is h over 184.3. I am going to do it. In fact, if you multiply both sides, you'll get what I'm about to put in the calculator. 184.3 times the sine of 84.7. And you get 183.5 feet. So it's only about a foot less in height than it was supposed to be. So that, that angle isn't actually too significant on its height. Now, if that angle is 50 degrees, if this thing was really cranked over, the height would be significantly shorter than. Now, again, the, in the actual length of the building, which was we called the height in quotes, is still 184.3. But again, if you actually just tried to measure straight up vertically, This distance right here, that is what would be this 183 and some change. And that wasn't actually part of the problem. It was just something I did for fun. All right, so we only have like four minutes left. I think it would be a terrible idea to introduce the formulas for law of cosines uh, with four minutes left. You've got a test to work on for the next two days anyways, so we'll go ahead and call it a day. Do not forget to take that test. If you miss the test, you will need some kind of doctor's note, court note, anything for me to give you any kind of makeup or replacing the final uh, exam uh, in that position, something like that. Replacing test two's grade with the final, that's one thing I do sometimes, again, with doctor's notes. But usually I just do uh, other attempts. But again, if you just say, hey, Mr. Beckner, I forgot, you're not getting another attempt. If you say, hey, Mr. Beckner, I was sick, I'm going to go, well, I need a doctor's note. All right. So. We have finished 7.1. This homework will be due in one week, which will be November 16th. So I'll have that set up in my math lab. Uh, again, everything else should be set up for your test. It is already set up, that is to say. So good luck. If you have any questions, email me. Remember, there is a review. The review will be very helpful for the test, as well as your notes. You can always go back and watch these lectures on YouTube. You've got tons of resources available. So I wish you all the best of luck. And I will see you on Wednesday. Oh, and uh, if I didn't mention, it is possible Wednesday I will not be able to record to do this live. Um, <laughs> part of that whole construction thing I was just mentioning, uh, I think I'm going to have to have someone come over during class time. It's unavoidable, unfortunately. It's not determined yet, but I may, if I have the time, I'll pre-record the class and then just you'll be able to play it during the class time. Uh, if I don't have time to pre-record it, I may end up just recording it Wednesday night, and then you'll have to watch the class Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, sometime in those four days. I don't want to have to do that last scenario unless I absolutely have to, but I'm not going to just miss another class. I have got to give y'all these recordings, these lectures. I don't want y'all to fall behind in terms of material. So again, best case scenario, I'm going to be pre-recording, and it'll just be ready for you by the start of class. Worst case scenario, it won't be pre prepared until that evening, 
Uh, and it's still possible that this all just defaults back to the live class, but what I will do is I will email you, I will keep you in touch with what's happening. So please check your emails, that way you'll know whether I'll be doing live, whether it will be recorded ahead of time, or if I unfortunately have to record it a few hours later, which again, I don't want to have to, but if I have to, I will. All right, now have a good day, and we'll see you Wednesday.